Joseph Stiglitz is one of the most prestigious economists in the world and probably one of the most recognized ones. In the last 30 years, his work and research have achieved worldwide recognition, making him a reference in the academic, political and social fields. Stiglitz is a professor at Columbia University and he is a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Moreover, he has become one of the most important experts in talking about the current economic crisis, its causes and consequences. A prolific and successful writer and speaker, he has come to La Coruña to give a lecture titled Can Capitalism Be Saved from Itself? Hello, Professor. Welcome to Fundación Barrier. Thank you. And thank you for joining us nice today. To be here. Professor, you have a vast knowledge about the causes and mechanisms underlying the, the crisis. Do you think it's the, the worst uh, crisis in the history of capitalism? It's probably not as serious as the Great Depression, but it's not over. So I think we'd have to say we're still in the middle of it. Uh, it began uh, with the breaking of the bubble in 2007, the recession in the United States began in December of 2007. Uh, it's over four years after that, and the end is uh, not really in sight, uh, particularly here in Europe, where uh, the uh, euro crisis has uh, come to the head. Uh, so there is a real risk that the Great Recession of 2008 becomes a little bit like the Great Depression, which is, it has its ups and uh, downs, but extends for a very long time. What are the more targeted measures to be taken to tackle such a situation in the short term, but while also considering the long-term repercussions? The first thing to remember is that as we're facing the short term, our long-term problems have not gone away and in some ways they become wet, worse. So among the long-term problems, global warming is a very severe problem and is continuing uh, to, to manifest itself in severe pa patterns of severe climate change. Uh, growing inequality, the downturn has actually exacerbated the problem of inequality. Global imbalances uh, have continued. So one of the things I hope that as we address the short run, we keep in mind what we need to do for the long run. Now, for the immediate term, the most important problem is lack of demand. Uh, lack of demand is uh, contributing to uh, lack of output, lack of employment, and it's a vicious circle from which uh, we seem to be very difficult to break out. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you something about the link between the United States and Europe. Do you think the recovery in your country is being put at risk uh, by what is happening in Europe and vice versa? The situation in Europe is being put at risk by what is happening in the States? Yeah, globalization has made all of us much more interdependent. The crisis began in the United States. We exported a lot of the toxic mortgages to Europe. If we hadn't, the economic downturn in the United States would have been much worse. So our problems were actually the precipitating factor for Europe's problems. But I now jokingly say Europe is now returning the favor because Europe's problems are going to make America's recovery that much more difficult. Talking about Europe, which could be your recommendation to tackle the debt crisis we are going through? Well, I think the European leaders have to recognize that austerity is not the answer. Austerity generates a vicious downward circle, a, a spiral, where demand is cut, output goes down, tax revenue goes down, and the hope for improvement in the fiscal position does not appear. Maybe it improves a little bit, but not, not as much as was hoped. Disappointment, credit, financial markets get upset, and things get worse and worse. We've seen that death spiral in Argentina, 
as chief economist of the World Bank, I saw it repeatedly. Uh, austerity by itself won't work. Now, for countries like Greece and Spain, there is no choice except some measures of austerity. But two things have to be done. One is that even within the confines of, of a budget envelope, there are things you could do to stimulate the economy. Uh, secondly, you have to make sure that you, the credit flow is maintained. Because one of the things going on now is that the banks are cutting back lending. And that, of course, deepens uh, the economic downturn. Finally, from the point of view of Europe, Europe has to realize that it is either going to work together or fall apart together. And that means measures like creating the euro bond, creating a solidarity fund for growth and stability, having the ECB, uh, European Central Bank, uh, buy and support uh, the sovereign debts of the individual countries and the banks of the individual countries. These are absolutely necessary. Uh, and uh, if the current pattern of reluctance to undertake these measures continues, uh, I think the future of the euro is bleak. Uh, do you think that the euro is at risk now? Oh, very much so. And there's a broad consensus among the economics community that it is at risk. Judgments differ about what the probability is because partly it's a political decision. What will the uh, Europe agree to do? I think everybody understands there is a, quote, commitment to save the euro. But the question is, will the politics allow them to do what needs to be done and to do it fast enough in sync, sync with the speed of financial markets? And uh, even if they act, will they act strong enough and fast enough? Uh, and I think, uh, big question mark whether that will happen. One of the reasons for that is the lack of solidarity. The lack uh, when, when people in Northern Europe saying we are not a transfer union, what they're saying is we're not going to help the countries that have problems. And when the euro was created, as I said, you took away the exchange rate and interest rate mechanism, you didn't put anything in its place. And if, unless you do that, uh, the future of the euro is going to look bleak. The real concern I have in, uh, about uh, many of the countries of Northern Europe is they rather give a lecture about what countries should have done in the past than to fix the problems so it will work in the future. Talking about the Spain, what are the concrete measures uh, you would recommend to the new government to tackle the situation? Well, there are three things I, I would recommend. First, re-examine tax and budgetary policies to shift those to things that will stimulate the economy. More progressive taxation. Tax the people at the top, lower the taxes at the bottom. Uh, Tax corporations that don't invest lower the taxes for those that do invest in Spain. Um, second, make use of a basic economic principle called the balanced budget multiplier, which means that if you raise taxes and use the revenue for spending, particularly on investments that increase the potential, productive potential of Spain going forward. You invested too little in the past. Now you need to invest to make up for that lack. If you do that, you grow the economy today and you grow the economy in the future. You increase tax revenue today. You increase tax revenue in the future. Your fiscal position becomes better. Thirdly, you have to maintain the flow of credit in the face of, of uh, weaknesses in the financial system. And unless you do that, the flow of money, credit to small and medium-sized enterprises will be constrained. Uh, business will be constrained. Employment, unemployment will go up. So these are three of the absolutely necessary things. And the fourth is, in the context of Europe, you need to argue for rethinking the conditions that are required to make the euro work. 
Uh, what about the, the labor market and, and wages? What, what do you think they should do in this field? Well, I don't claim to be an expert on Spanish labor markets. Uh, there is a wide consensus that there are some rules, some rigidities in the labor system that impede its functioning. And uh, those reforms, if that's true, need to be, be, need to be done. But you should remember two things. Uh, those won't happen. Uh, the effects of that won't be felt overnight. Those take a time, time for it to be felt. And secondly, the real problem today is a lack of demand. And these are supply side measures that will not solve the problem of lack of demand. The third observation I would make is the following. The U.S. has widely viewed to be the most flexible labor market, and yet we have a massive unemployment problem. One out of six American workers would like a full-time job, can't get one. Not as bad as Spain, but still a massive unemployment problem. And what that shows is that flexibility by itself won't solve Spain's problems. You have been to Tunisia and Egypt uh, this year, and you also visited uh, the indignant campsites in Madrid last July. More recently, you have been to the Occupy Wall Street movement in New York City. What's your opinion about these movements? Do you think they can bring, help bring about a real change? Yes, I do. I, I think they're very important. As statements that something is wrong. Our economic system is not working the way it's supposed to. Our economic system has failed the youth in all these countries. But so has the political system. If the political system had responded, they wouldn't need to take to the streets. And it's obvious we understand that in Egypt and Tunisia because these are not democracies. And so they had no alternative. The system not only it created massive unemployment, but it was unjust. Those who got jobs were those who were politically connected. But we often fail to understand, say in the United States, our political system has failed us. And that is what these young people are saying. They are angry because what they saw, the perpetrators, those who had caused the economic crisis, the banks, who, the bank officials, who walked off, are the only people who benefited from the crisis. They've walked off with millions and millions of dollars in bonuses at the taxpayer's expense. This is unfair. And now it's the youth that are paying the future, the, the problem. They will have to deal with the debt. They will have to deal, they now face high unemployment. So what they're saying is something is wrong. Now, on the streets, in the protest, they're not going to give the answer. That's not the function of a protest movement. The function of a protest movement is to draw attention to the fact that our system is not working. And then the media takes it up, looks at it in more detail, and lo and behold, what are they finding? These young protesters are right. Something is wrong. And then it becomes the obligation of the political leaders and the experts to design solutions that will at least partially address the problems that they've raised. Talking about taking solutions, taking measures, sometimes agreements are reached in the heat of the moment, let's say. Uh, but in the end, they are not uh, implemented. Uh, for instance, the, the supervision on uh, rating agencies or maybe the need of uh, uh, a better regulation of financial markets. None of them have been implemented in the end. You can you explain why? In that particular case, uh, the reason goes back to the, uh, the concern about the 99%, uh, the problem of the influence of the banks in our politics. Um, the uh, problem is that they are, that America's political system is very dependent on campaign contributions. 
and the banks make very big campaign contributions. They may have made very bad investments in mortgages. They made very good investments in Washington, and they've gotten a very big return. So when the legislation was passed, they delegated responsibility for implementing it to well, places like the Federal Reserve where the banks have an enormous amount of influence. So to me, it's not a surprise. It was predicted. Uh, the question is, how do we stop that? Now, in a way, the continuing problems that the global economy is having, the evident uh, evidence that there is lack of transparency, the fact that no one knows who is exposed to the Greek debt and what the consequences will be, has brought home to Americans, Europeans, that we haven't fixed our banking system. A recent survey in the United States said that 75% of all Americans believe that we need stronger regulation. And the concern is that while that may be the view of hundreds of millions of Americans, 10 banks have almost as much influence as those uh, hundreds of millions of Americans. Uh, whether our politics will change is a, is a question uh, that's still up in the air. One of the proposals that is falling into a political limbo is the uh, taxation of uh, financial transactions. What's your opinion about this uh, tax? Do you think uh, it's possible to establish this tax worldwide? It's going to be very difficult because the United States, which seems to be controlled by the banks, <laughs> it says no. Um, so the question is, can Europe go ahead without the United States? And the answer to that is clear, yes. So I think what has to be done is that Europe has to take the lead, has to adopt a financial transaction tax. It can be done. Uh, it can be done on the basis of, of, of the per, uh, corporations or individuals originating the transaction and uh, it will generate substantial amounts of revenues and at the very low tax rates that are talked about will not induce uh, any significant distortions. I think it will actually improve the efficiency of, of our markets because it will discourage a lot of this high frequency trade which is actually undermining the efficiency of markets. And what about the, the revenues? What should they be uh, used for? Uh, originally, I had hoped that the revenues would be used for promoting climate change and development. Uh, but clearly, in the short run, there are huge financial needs in Europe to promote growth. So, uh, in a sense, I think that has to be up to the political processes uh, in Europe of how to use those revenues. I do hope that after recovery has set in, that this is, would be a good source of money dedicated to, to uh, addressing the, some of these key global problems like climate change and development. Another measure that has been in the agenda for years is the reform of financial of institutions like IMF or United Nations. Do you think we should consider to rethink multilateralism before reforming institutions? No, I think these institutions uh, are going to be an important part uh, of the future. Uh, globalization requires uh, multilateral institutions. So the quicker we get on with the task of making their governance consistent with our principles and our values, the better off we'll be. Um, it makes no sense to have uh, institutions uh, created in 1944 with governance reflecting the economic balance of power of earlier decades in the 21st century. So we have to adapt these institutions, which played an important role, sometimes for good and sometimes not for good. But we, we need to adapt them to the 21st century. Well, in the end, advocates of liberalism say that solution is strengthening liberalism, is it? Um, the notion that liberalization by itself will solve any of these problems is just wrong. Um, 
liberalization, uh, too often leads to job destruction without job creation. People are, for instance, in protected sectors. The economic theory says, the false economic theory says, it's better if they were in more productive employment. But what actually happens? They go from protected sector to unemployment. That's not an increase in productivity. That's not an increase in well-being. Um, liberalization in financial markets is what led to the crisis. So the notion that liberalization by itself is a solution is just wrong. Now, obviously, some economies have had excessive rigidities. But even when you uh, deal with those, you have to ask, why do they come in the first place? So in many countries, there are job protections. Why? Because the market have failed. The market failed to provide good insurance. So if you take away the job protection, you have to add something. You have to have other ways of providing security. And that's what Denmark has done in their system of flex security. They recognize the market failure. So when we look around and we see something that we don't like, usually there's a reason it's there. And usually the reason is something, the market has failed in some way or another. And so we have to understand, maybe we didn't get the right answer in correcting the market failure. But that doesn't mean the market failure wasn't there. It only means that we have to look for another better way of addressing what is a real social concern. It is often said that the uh, economy rules the world, and day after day we can read uh, headlines with a famous phrase coined in your country that it's, it's the economy is stupid. But who does really actually rules the world? Goldman Sachs, Bilderberg Group, greedy individuals behind the markets? Well, our economy is so complex that I don't think one could say that any single individual group rules. But the question is relative influence. And unfortunately, the problem in the United States and in some of the European countries is that what I call it in one of my papers, we have a government of the 1%, for the 1%, and by the 1%. So, the 1% really has a disproportionate role in shaping policy, particularly in the financial sector. They do it not only through money, but money is an important ingredient, campaign contributions, revolving doors, um, lobbying, but they do it through other means. Uh, they have a disproportionate influence over the media. Uh, Rupert Murdoch has gotten, his, his, his publication got a lot of attention recently. Um, Fox News, they really help shape opinion, but they do it in a very biased way. They have an agenda, and their agenda is, a, quite frankly, a very conservative agenda. Uh, it's not shaped by economic science. It's not shaped by, by a balanced discussion of views. It's really a, a, a propaganda to use a word we, th we think of communism as having propaganda. Well, Rupert Murdoch is involved, and Fox News is involved in right-wing propaganda to try to shape people's mind. Um, in economics, we refer to some of this as cognitive capture. Uh, that the technocrats, the people at the central bank, the Federal Reserve, ECB, are captured by the mindset of the financial community. So it's partly because they are occupying a lot of the important positions, but it's not just money is what I want to emphasize. It's because they help shape our views, our perceptions. And that's why it's so important to, to, to have a, a, a lively democratic debate to point out that many of those ideas are flawed. The ideas that markets are necessarily on their own efficient or stable. 
That was an idea that was pushed by conservatives, by the free marketeers around the world. Well, in the aftermath of the crisis, it should be obvious that that was wrong. But economic science pointed out 30 years ago that that was wrong. But the ideologues of the right didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to look at what the science was saying. They wanted to go ahead with their simplistic views and their self-interested views of saying, don't worry, markets always work. That was wrong. And that's why it's so important to, to save capitalism from itself, because I think that markets have an enormous amount of power. They have transformed our world. But unless we save capitalism from itself, it has a tendency to these, go to these excesses, which can be so destructive. Professor, thank you for spending your time with us. Thank you. It has been an honor.